you have your Bible, uh, open your Bible with me to Daniel chapter 11. Uh, so we're making our way through. And uh, this chapter, wow, uh, this is a very interesting, uh, fascinating chapter of the book of Daniel. Uh, I want to share with you tonight about a ram, a goat, and a king of bold face. Uh, we're going to read about that. Yes. Yes, I'm sorry. Chapter 8. What did I say? Yeah, yeah, okay. Chapter 8. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I... Yeah. Chapter 8. I was cross-referencing 11. We'll, we'll get into a little bit of 11 tonight. I guess I had 11 on my brain. But yeah, chapter 8, a goat, a ram, a goat, and a king of bold face is kind of our topic tonight. But tonight is, is a lot of predictive, his, uh, predictive prospects prophecy. Uh, you know, the word prophecy can mean just preaching, but predictive prophecy is when you tell history in advance. And that's what we see in Daniel tonight to, a, to an incredible degree. Uh, predictive prophecy where he is really speaking way out in advance of history. And the prophecy in Daniel is truly amazing. Uh, the details of Daniel's prophecies are so complete that some liberal scholars have even questioned the date of Daniel's writings. I mean, we know Daniel wrote it, you know, in, in the 6th century B.C. Uh, and, and that's, you know, we know that's true. But some people are, that are liberal are saying there was no way he could have known all this. So they're wanting to date it like in the 160s B.C., because they're just like, you know, the prophecies are just too uh, clearly stated. There's no way. But yet we know the, the way maker, right? We know that there is a way, that God is, is the God who knows history in advance. And so, so that's what's amazing about it. Uh, in Daniel chapter 2 and in Daniel chapter 7, God has already revealed to Daniel the four great world empires of the Gentiles and a future one that will emerge in the end times under the authority of the Antichrist. We've already talked about those and we're not through talking about those. We'll get back uh, to those again. But uh, tonight, uh, he's going to focus pr predominantly on, on two of them, on two of those empires. And so in our text, God narrows Daniel's prophetic focus to two of the coming empires, and to a man who I believe prefigured the Antichrist. This man is not the final Antichrist, but you know there are many Antichrists that have come throughout history. That's not the final one, but there are those that prefigured him. And we're going to look at a very interesting figure uh, tonight that Daniel speaks of, and that Jesus later uh, came back and referred to as well. So pretty deep stuff tonight, so hang with me. But uh, the main idea I want to share with you tonight, and this is simple, is that the God we serve is in complete control. Amen? Amen. The God we serve is in complete control. And that stands out tonight in chapter 8. I mean, if He can tell this stuff, if God can reveal this stuff way out in advance, and it happens exactly the way God said it, He's in control. And that gives us all comfort tonight because we're, we're living in a period, I think, of prophecy being fulfilled and I think it's being fulfilled all around us. And, you know, we, we look out and we see the darkness and we see trouble and we see pain and suffering and, and yet our God is, is in control. He, he's in control. So let's read this chapter and kind of get our bearings and then let's come back and, and talk about it. So Daniel chapter 8, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. All right, so we're back now before the fall of the Babylonian Empire. So Daniel's kind of going back and filling in the gap. So we're not chronologically, we've already seen the Babylonian Empire fall. But Daniel's going back and telling us about some of the dreams that he had. So in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, and he was the last king of Babylon before it fell to the Medes and the Persians. Uh, so in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me the first. And we looked at the first last week. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, 
Uh, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision, and I was at the uh, Eula Canal, and I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram. All right, so there's our ram, and the ram is standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher one came up last, and I saw the ram charging westward, northward, and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. And I, as I was considering this, behold, a male goat. So now we come to the goat. A goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. That's a fast goat. And the goat had a uh, conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal. And he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him, and struck the ram, and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground, trampled on him, and there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead of it, so this, this, this ram had a horn that we read about, a male goat, or this goat had it, had a horn, one horn, and, and it, uh, it, when it broke, the great horn broke, instead there came four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. You are totally confused, aren't you? All right. Well, we're going to clear it up. All right. So, out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, toward the glorious land. This little horn now that came out of the four that came from the goat. All right. So, you had a goat, one horn, that horn broke, then you had four. Out of one of the four came a little horn. All right. So, we're reading about the little horn. He grew, he grew exceedingly great uh, toward the south, toward the east, toward the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven, and some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host, and the regular burnt offering was taken from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And a, a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground. And it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering and the transgression that makes desolate and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot. And he said to me for 2300 evenings and mornings, which is about six and a third year, and the sanctuary shall be restored uh, in its rightful state. So when I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Eula, and it called Gabriel, made this man understand the vision. So Gabriel, the angel, showed up. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. Hmm. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns... All right, so now we're going to begin to get understanding. Gabriel's going to clear it up for us, all right? I'm glad Gabriel helps us out with this, all right? So Gabriel says, uh, The ram that you saw with the two horns are the kings of, the Me of Media and Persia. So the ram is, is Media and Persia. And, you know, in, in the vision he had earlier, it was a bear. But now, you know, in this new vision, it's a ram that had two horns. And so it's Media and Persia, 
And remember, one was stronger than the other, so that would be Persia. And then the goat, all right, so the goat is Greece that came after Median Persia that conquered them. So the goat comes uh, after the, Medi- the Persian Empire came the, the Greek Empire. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. So that was who? Alexander the Great, right? So we know the great horn was Alexander the Great. It's for the horn that was broken. So he, he, he died in his early age. Uh, 33. 33. In place of which four others arose, which four kingdoms, and we'll talk about those in a minute, shall arise from this nation, but not with his power. Never quite gain the power that he had. And, and at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face. So a king of bold face is going to come out of one of the four empires that succeeded Alexander the Great. A king of bold face, one who understood riddles shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. Hmm. He's going to have power that's coming from another source. And he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and people who are the saints. He's going to destroy a lot of the saints. By his cunning he shall make deceit prosper under his hand and in his own mind he shall become great. Without warning he shall destroy many and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes. And he shall be broken by no human hand. Boy, when he rises up against the prince of princes, that's a mistake, isn't it? And he's going to be broken, but it's not coming from human hand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days... (laughs) Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. Heavenly Father, thank you for this great vision. I pray that we can gain understanding about it tonight, and I pray, God, that we will realize that no matter what we we know about this vision, we know that you are in control. God, thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's try to break all this down. And uh, there's four things I want to share with you about what I understand about this. And uh, I'm going to give you, you know, what I understand about it, all right? So I'm having to try to interpret it. And in some of these things, you, you use the best interpretive ability that you can. Some of it's clear. But let's, uh, let's kind of go through it. Number one, the thing that we see in verse 1 through 9 are the approaching empires, all right? So Daniel, as he had this vision, was still in Babylon. And he's already seeing in the vision that the Babylonian empire, as great as it was, is not going to last. He's already seeing the next great empire, and God's revealing to him that it's the Medes and the Persians, that the Medes and the Persians are going to be the next great empire, that they're going to conquer the Babylonians, and they did. I mean, we, we read about that already uh, earlier in, in Daniel chapter 5. You know, the handwriting was on the wall, and the Medes and the Persians conquered the Babylonians in one day because of their overconfidence and their uh, immorality. And so he's going to see the approaching empires. The first one in verse 1 through 4 in verse 20 is the kings of Media and Persia. And he sees them in his vision as a ram. And so in verse uh, 1 through 4, we see that uh, he has this vision. I saw this vision, and it was when he was in Susa at the citadel. And I raised my eyes, and behold, there was a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns. So your two horns are the Medes and the Persians. So the Medes and the Persians made up the, the, the empire that conquered the Babylonians. Both horns were high, but one was higher than the other. So the, the Persian aspect of that was greater than the, the Medes. 
And, 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 and in latter days, it ref, began to be referred to just as the Persian Empire. You know, we didn't even refer to it as the Medes and the Persians. That was at the beginning, but later it just became the Persian Empire. So there you go. Pretty, pretty specific prophecy that hasn't happened yet. One was higher than the other. One came up last. I saw the ram charging westward, northward, southward. And so that was the direction... Uh, historically, that the Persian Empire began to conquer large, vast amounts of territory. No beast could stand before it. Uh, there was no one who could rescue from its power, and he did as he pleased. So we look in verse 20, and, and Gabriel, who comes to interpret it, says, As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. So, God interprets it for us. And uh, we're, we're told exactly who they are. Alright, so the second kingdom, and now we're going way out because, you know, the Median Persian Empire is not existence yet, but Daniel saw it. And then the next empire he sees is the kingdom of Greece. And, and the kingdom of Greece, if we go back to verse 5, was uh, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching ground. And, you know, we all are amazed, or historians are amazed at how quickly Alexander the Great conquered the world. I mean, he, it was swift, it was powerful, it was uh, ruthless, and um, the goat became exceedingly great, it says. Uh, the, the great kingdom exceeded all the way to India, exceeding any kingdom before it in its size. Approximately 1.5 million square miles was the kingdom of Alexander the Great. And so uh, he conquered and, uh, and the goat had a, a horn between its eyes, which is Alexander the Great. He just came and ran into the ram with its two horns and st tr stomped on it. And it says in verse 8, the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, uh, the great horn was broken. So Alexander the Great, after he conquered the earth, uh, he died you know, when he was in his early 30s. So he didn't live very long. It's amazing he did all that he did in, in such a, a short time. Now after he died, uh, there are four horns that rise up to take its place. And uh, so the four horns represent, and we know this from history, the, the Greek sectors was uh, Cassander was one of the generals that uh, followed Alexander the Great. And that was Macedonia, the, the region of Macedonia. And then Lysimachus was the king that uh, was over Thrace and Asia Minor. And then Seleucus, and that's very important. Remember the name Seleucus. He, uh, this was over Syria, Israel, Babylon. So the, that, that's Israel. And, and, and the Babylonians uh, was the Seleucus. And then Ptolemy was the fourth. So you've got Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. And Ptolemy, we know, is Egypt, right? Egypt and Arabia. So these, these are the four that are referred to as the four winds, the four horns. And they, didn't, they never did reach the level of power of Alexander the Great, but they were over the Greek Empire. Now, get this, guys. Daniel's given us these things in about 500 B.C., a little... 560 B.C. And hundreds of years before these things actually happened. He's not only telling us about Alexander the Great, but he's telling us about the four kings that would come after Alexander the Great. That's why scholars think there's just no way. I mean, it's too detailed. I mean, it's too specific. There's just no way they, they think that Daniel could have wrote this when, when we know that he did. They don't believe how big God is. They don't believe how big God is, right. So we jump over to 21, 
And you say, well, pastor, how do you know all these things? Well, Gabriel told us. If Gabriel said it, we know it, right? So Gabriel said in verse 21, the goat is the kingdom of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. Well, we know who that is. That's Alexander the Great. As for the horn that was broken in, pl in, uh, in place of which four others rose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. And at the later end of the kingdom, when the transgressors have reached the limit, a king of bold face will, will come, one who understands riddles. All right, so... So we know in history uh, that what Gabriel's telling us is exactly what happened. So we see the approaching kingdoms. God gave Daniel a vision of that. All right, now we're going to turn to the, what I think is the most interesting part of this is not, on, not only do we see the approaching kingdoms, the approaching empires, but number two, the Antichrist is foreshadowed. So we're going to see the Antichrist foreshadowed. And out of the Seleucus side of the kingdom, out of the four, there's going to come a king and uh, his name is going to be Antiochus. Now Antiochus III that came out of that region, you know, he, he won great victory for Israel. He, he defeated Egypt uh, he he kind of cast the Egyptians out and took Israel as as a part of the Syrian side of the four em empires. So Antiochus the third was looked at as somebody who God used to bring Israel, you know, under under that reign, get, break free from Egypt. But then his son Antiochus the fourth is referred to as Antiochus Epiphanes. The, 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 he gave himself that name. He, he's really uh, Antiochus IV. He gave himself the name Epiphanes, which means glorious one. It tells you a little bit about him, right? He was a king with a bold face. Uh, yeah, he was arrogant. He thought he was God. And so he gave himself the name Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus the glorious one. And he is, he is an incredibly evil man. He, he reigned from 175 to 163 B.C. And we're, we're going to read about his, his evil that he does. And, and he is a prefiguring. He, he is a prototype of the Antichrist who is to come. So let's, let's look at him. So verse 9, out of one of them came a little horn. So the little horn is Antiochus Epiphanes. He grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, toward the glorious land. That's Israel, right? And it, it, uh, it grew great even to the host of heaven. And some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled them. So he's going to start killing God's people. He brought great persecution. A lot of the Jews were martyred uh, during Antioch of Pithne's reign. They were thrown to the ground trampled. This horn became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offerings was taken away. And so he, uh, during his reign, he stopped worship in the temple. He, he said that you, he, he stopped circumcision. He said, you cannot no longer circumcise. He stopped sacrifice. He says, you can no longer sacrifice. You can no longer worship this God. And if you do, I'll kill you. And that's exactly what he did. And there were many... Uh, I'll read a little bit in a moment about the history of that. But let's kind of keep looking. Um, he... Uh, then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to one who spoke, for how long... Uh, concerning the regular burnt offerings and the transgression that makes desolate. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. The transgression that desecrated the temple and the giving over of the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. He said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, uh, then the sanctuary will be restored to its rightful state. So I was about six and a third years. And so we jump over and look at what... Um, 
Gabriel said about him, verse 23, And at the later end of the kingdom, when the transgressions have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles shall rise. So understanding riddles means that he was uh, wise in the ways of the world, right? He was deceptive. He was, he was very wise from the standpoint of worldly wisdom. His power shall be great, but not his own power. Hmm. Okay, so he's demonic, right? He's, he's operating under the power of the evil one, and he will cause fear and destruction and shall succeed in what he does, and he will destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. So he's going to kill the saints. By his cunning he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind he will become great. Without warning he shall destroy many. So he just ruthless. He didn't give any warning. He just comes to kill. He shall even rise up against the prince of princes. That's Jesus. He shall rise up, and he shall, but he shall be broken by no human hand. So he's going to be broken by God. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. So we're talking about the end time. Let's real quickly, I want you to go with me to... Uh, chapter 11, that's why I announced chapter 11 earlier because I was reading this before I came in. Chapter 11 is kind of giving us further description of, of this same uh, person. And it says in verse 21, "...in his place shall arise a contemptible person." So that's, that's who this Antioch is Pythonies, "...to whom royal majesty has not been given, he shall come in." without warning, and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Armies shall be utterly swept away before him and broken, even the prince of the covenant. And from the time that an alliance is made with him, he shall act deceitfully and he shall become strong with a small people. All right, jump down to um, verse uh, 31. Forces... From him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. We've heard that before, right? Jesus referred to that. And he shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. And the wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. When they stumble, they shall receive a little help, and many shall join themselves to them with flattery. And some of the wise shall stumble, so that they may be refined, purified, made white until the time of the end. For it still awaits the appointed time, and the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished, for what is decreed shall be done. Now um, look at verse 41. He shall come into the glorious land, and ten thousands, ten thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand. Look at verse 46. He shall pitch his partial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. That's the battle of Armageddon. So, you know, the parallelism of Scripture is, is that Antiochus Epiphanes in so many amazing ways is a foreshadowing of what the Antichrist is going to be. The Antichrist, which we believe is in the final kingdom of a one world government, is going to do the same thing. And you know, I wish we had time to dive into the book of Revelation. Some of you have been through the Revelation study with me. We talk about the seven years of tribulation and that the Antichrist, which will then be the ultimate Antichrist, the the one who is Antiochus Epiphanes and all the others that came before him 
in one with a one world government, with a one world economic system, will kill those who don't take the mark of the beast. And Israel will be coming together to worship. I believe that the temple that is going to be rebuilt, the, the final temple that will be rebuilt after the seven years begin, and that Jewish people, the Jews that start turning to Jesus during the seven years tribulation, they will see Him whom they pierced and mourn for Him as one mourns for an only son, is what Zechariah says. Uh, Jeremiah said it's a time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be saved out of it. I believe that the, the Israelites who are blinded now are going to come to Christ and they're going to rebuild their temple and they're going to start offering sacrifices, but this time they're going to be offering them not out of religious ritual, but as an act of worship, realizing those sacrifices represent Jesus. They're going to be worshiping Jesus. And, and, and the Antichrist, will, for three and a half years, will let them do it. But at the midpoint of that, he's going to say no more. And just like Antioch of Epiphanes, he's going to kill them. He's going to bring a whole uh, terror against them. He will stop sacrifice. And just like Antioch of Epiphanes, he will desecrate the temple. Uh, let me, yeah, Mark. This sanctuary, it just hit me while you were talking about this. This sanctuary occurred in history between the first temple that the Babylonians destroyed and the second temple which the Romans destroyed, right? Does history tell us where this sanctuary was? It was, uh, it was the remodeled sanctuary that was... Ezra rebuilt. Yeah, yeah. And it was, it was on the... Uh, Temple Mount. Really? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's the re after the. So did Solomon just continue on with that? Oh no no Solomon's temple was totally destroyed. Yeah, yeah destroyed. But yeah. He, he added on to a, a temple. Yeah. Is it the same one? No 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 that that temple was totally destroyed and then Ezra, Nehemiah built the wall. Ezra there came. Three temples. It was two and a half, kind of. <laughs> because because the, the one that Ezra built was not totally destroyed. So they came back and re, rebuilt it. They, they remodeled it and, and rebuilt it. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Nehemiah also the same time frame? Nehemiah and Ezra, or is that different yes. time? Mm -hmm. yes. Nehemiah built the wall. Yeah. And Ezra built the temple. But yeah. This was in yes. In a, yeah. Yeah. In yeah. 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 So Antiochus Epiphanes goes into this temple. Let, let me read to you a little bit of the history. This is from uh, David Jeremiah uh, is is giving this history of Antiochus the third, Antiochus the fourth. He said one of the most famous kings of the northern kingdom, the Seleucids, was Antiochus the Great or Antiochus III. Now that's not the one we're talking about. That's his predecessor. His rule was long from 223 to 187. He was an important figure in Israel's history because under his reign, control for Israel shifted from the Ptolemies, Egypt, the southern kingdom, to the Seleucids, the northern kingdom. Uh, this set the stage for the next important phase of Israel's history. The atrocities the Jews would suffer under Antiochus III's vile son, Antiochus Epiphanes or Antiochus IV, a historical type or foreshadowing figure of the Antichrist. Antiochus Epiphanes persecuted the Jewish people exclusively for their religious faith, just as the Antichrist will. He once caught a group of Jews in a cave observing the Sabbath. He then had the mouth of the cave sealed with fires set inside to suffocate them. Historians recorded that during his march on Jerusalem, Antiochus IV killed some 80,000 Jews, took 40,000 people and sold them into slavery, also plundered and desecrated the temple. Yet his power would come to an end and he would be destroyed in 144 
uh, B.C. by Judas Maccabees who took back the temple. He rededicated it to God in a feast the Jews will celebrate to this day called Hanukkah. And uh, although an even greater enemy of God and His people will arise in the future, the Antichrist, the vision reveals an important principle. Behind the events of history lies a sovereign God who directs the affairs. So that, that is how ruthless he was. Now, when he desecrated the temple, this Antioch Epiphanes, when he, was, when he said, you can't sacrifice here, he demanded that they worship Zeus. And so he set up an idol of Zeus in the temple and he sacrificed pigs in the temple to the god Zeus. And of course, that would be the most disrespectful thing you could do to Jewish people, right? Is sacrifice the blood of pigs to the altar of Zeus inside the temple. So that is about as... Now that is what we refer to as the abomination of desecration. So that was an abominable to God. It was desecrating the temple. And so we think about his character. You know, as we look at our outline, the Antichrist foreshadowed his character. He was a riddler. He was deceptive. He, he took away truth. He was cunning. And... Uh, and in 1 John chapter 2, 18, John, who wrote the book of Revelation, said, Little children is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know it is the last hour. So don't, don't, don't miss what he's saying. Many Antichrists have come. So there are, there are those that, that are under the control of Satan who have reflected the hatred, the, the vow of the Antichrist, but the Antichrist is coming. He hadn't, he's not here yet. He's the one that is out there in the future who will represent the evil of all of these others to a, a, an even greater degree. In Matthew 24, in all that discourse, Jesus said, he, He's speaking to the Jewish people, and he's, he's telling them about the end times. And He said, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, Jesus said, spoken by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. So when we get to the book of Revelation, it, we'll see that the Antichrist is going to do the same thing. He's going to desecrate the temple. Except this time he's going to set up an image of himself. The Antichrist will set up an image of himself in a rebuilt temple. And he will demand that you worship him. And that's going to be at the three and a half year mark of the tribulation, and that the three and a half year marks what we call the great tribulation. And that's why Jesus is telling the Jews that when that happens, flee. You know, get out of Jerusalem. Don't, don't stay in Jerusalem anymore. You know, flee to the mountains. Get, get out because things are going to get really tough. Pastor, can you... comes to my mind several names that think so much of themselves in this day that you could see any one of them setting up an image of their self. Yeah. Some of them in this country. Yeah. And others around the world. So the spirit of the Antichrist is already at work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't... I mean, there's no way we could start naming names of who the Antichrist is going to be. I mean... But, uh, but yeah, I mean, the, spirit, uh, the Bible says the spirit of the Antichrist is already here. Yeah. And so, so I interesting, fascinating stuff. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the next thing I want you to see is the angel Gabriel. He, he's an interesting figure here. Uh, this is the first instance in Scripture where a good angel is named. And, and so Gabriel... The meaning of his name is mighty one, mighty one of God. 
And, and I, I, these angels are just amazing figures, aren't they? And they show up in Daniel. They show up in Revelation. We see them throughout Scripture. They're servants of God. And, and we see the message that, uh, that is from God there in verse 17 through 22 where he revealed the meaning of the vision. So he cared about Daniel. And he comes to say, I know this is a, I know this is a really wild vision, but let me explain it to you. Let me help you understand what is about to happen. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 about angels, it says, Are they not all ministering spirits set forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? And so he came to minister to Daniel. All right, the fourth thing, the last thing I want us to look at tonight are the applications considered. Because you're like, okay, how do we apply all this to our life, right? I mean, how does this apply? Um, Daniel, I mean, he, he fainted and got sick, right? So... You know, two things that I want you to realize with me that, that God's prophecies are literally fulfilled. A lot of people don't take the Bible literally. And of course there are certain places that are not meant to be taken literally. But that's very clear when it's not meant, when it's figurative. It's very clear. It's obvious that it's a metaphor, you know, it's... It, but, but most of the Bible, unless it's clearly a metaphor, is literal. And you, you think about all the prophecies of the Bible, they, they were literally fulfilled. Jesus was literally born of a virgin. He was literally born in the city of Bethlehem. You know, He was literally uh, the lamb led to the slaughter and he was afflicted, wounded for our afflictions and all we like sheep have gone astray and God literally laid upon him the sins of the whole world. So I mean, everything that, that was said about Jesus, he literally fulfilled. Well, when we come to end time prophecy, a lot of people take the book of Revelation and think, well, you know, you can't take it literal, it's all symbolic. And I'm like, uh oh. No, no, no. There's no reason to, to go there. Because if, if, he, if Jesus literally fulfilled the remarkable prophecies about His first coming, if Daniel gave this kind of literal prophecies that were literally fulfilled by people like Alexander the Great and the four generals that followed him, then why in the world would we think the book of Revelation is not to be literally fulfilled? That there is going to be a literal uh, coming of a, of a seven years of tribulation, a literal coming of an antichrist, a literal persecution and all great tribulation, all the things that follow. So we need to look at where we are, the times through the lens of Scripture. We're, we're not to be ignorant on this. Some people are afraid of the book of Revelation. But what is the book of Revelation? What does the word revelation mean? Revealing. The revealing, the unveiling. It, it doesn't mean the mystery, right? So the book of Re Revelation, although it is a book you have to really dig into, it is not a mystery. It is the revealing of the things that are to come. Now, the second thing I want you to realize with me this evening is that God's power is wonderfully comforting. All of this may trouble you, <laughs> but it comforts me. And let me tell you why it comforts me. Because my soul, God, is in control. I mean, He is in control to a degree that you may not even realize. I mean... How did Daniel tell us about all this before it ever happened to such an incredible degree? I mean, he, couldn't have, he could not have told us these things and they come literally true if God is not completely in control. So even in a day like this when so many people, I think, are anxious because we're living in a troubled time, and there's genuine anxiety out there, and I think our kids feel that, and governments and the world is just in a mess. Where do we find comfort? In the reality that God is in control. 
This is not the first time the world's been in a mess, right? I mean, the world's been in a mess before. This is nothing new. But, but no matter how big the mess, guess who's in charge? Guess who's in control? Guess who's moving everything toward, toward His divine plan? And His divine plan ultimately is the return of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is coming back. And, and at this period of time when it does seem like Everything is moving in a bad direction. The Antichrist is going to win. It says, you know, in just one moment, you know, he, he stood against the prince and the prince crushed him. You know, the battle of Armageddon is going to be over like that. So we comfort one another with these words. We find comfort in these words. Let, let's look kind of at, in closing at what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 through 8. He said, now brethren, so he's speaking to Christians, brothers, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. So the falling away is apostasy. It's many people turning away from God. Well, boy, have we ever seen that in Europe, right? Europe used to be the bastion of great churches and great preachers. You know, Spurgeon and, and all those great churches that were in Europe. Uh, all the great schools that were in Europe that used to be higher levels of learning of Bible, all are apostate now. I mean, there's hardly any evangelical churches in, in Europe and around the world. So there, there, there has been a falling away. Even in America, you know, we've seen a falling away. So, so the, the falling away is going to come first. You know, Timothy, Paul said to Timothy, you know, perilous times will come. And men will be lovers of self and lovers of pleasure and lovers of money, disobedient to their parents. And he said, this is just the beginning. So, so the falling away is going to come. And, and then he said, after the falling away, the, the man of sin is revealed. Now I believe the man of sin, the, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worships, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Who is that? The That's the Antichrist. The, the Antichrist. The and yet, there's very much similarities there to everything we read about Antiochus Pythanes, right? But yet, this is the, the one that's still coming, according to Paul, the, the son of perdition. He opposes, exalts himself above all that is God. He's going to sit as God in the temple of God, showing that He is God. And then Paul said, Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that He may not be revealed in His own time. So there, there's a restraining force. He can't be revealed while this restraining force is restraining Him. And then he says this, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. The mystery of lawlessness is definitely already at work. I mean, we see it every day. The, the, the mystery of evil, of, of everything that's going on. Uh, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, and you know, it depends on what version of the Bible you read in, in, in the... King James, that's capital He, who now restrains, will do so until He is taken out of the way. Hmm. So, the lawless one, the Antichrist, cannot be revealed till the one who restrains, He who restrains, is taken out of the way. And... Uh, it says, then the lawless one will, re, be, will be revealed, and then it just adds this, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of His mouth and destroy with the brightness of His coming. I mean, just, hey, let's just cut through the chase. This pompous king of bold face, 
may think that he's something, but in just one sentence it says, the Lord will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him with the brightness of his coming. So he's going to be destroyed at the coming of Christ. But the interesting question in all of this is he cannot be revealed until he, the restraining force, is taken out of the way. So the obvious question we have to all ask is, who is he? Who is the restraining force? And when, when is the restraining force going to be taken out of the way? At the rapture. And that's, to me, the obvious answer. That Which is the evidence for pre-trib rapture. That's what I believe. That's, my, that's one of my strong theological positions of believing in a pre-trib rapture. That, that the Antichrist is not going to be revealed until the rapture of the church. Because the rapture of the church is when He, the work of the Holy Spirit in the church, is going to be taken out of the way. I mean, as, as evil as the world is now, can you imagine how evil it's going to be when there are no Christians here? When not one true preacher of the gospel, not one true uh, evangelist of Christ, not one true church is left. Can you imagine how evil the world's going to be? I mean, uh, it, it's... it's the ability to understand what that will be like. We don't, you know, we don't. The Spirit is here with the 12,000 Jews that are protected in Revelation. Yeah. That are the evangelists at that point in time. Yeah, I, I think that, that they're definitely going to be uh, protected by God. You know, they're, now that, that's when, uh, so when He is taken out of the way, the Antichrist is revealed, then the revival among the Jewish people starts happening. And I think the Holy Spirit will be active in them. But He'll be taken out of the way for the Antichrist to be revealed, and then He'll start moving, you know, in the lives of the Jewish people, and the Jewish people will turn to God. The Jewish people will uh, experience an incredible revival. 144,000 of them will become missionaries, you know, sharing the gospel. And, um, and then th two prophets that are going to be like Elijah and Elisha are going to come. They're going to be able to do miracles that will be Jewish. So there's going to be the work of God. But in the middle of that, we read, we read in the book of Revelation that all through that there are these new people showing up in heaven. And everybody's like, well, who are they? And they're the ones coming out of the tribulation with their robes white. So there's going to be a lot of martyrs that are going to be coming out of the great tribulation that would not take the mark of the beast. And that's going to be mainly the Jewish people. I think that very few Gentiles who had the opportunity to be saved, will be saved during that same period of time. Because it says that strong delusion will come upon them. Like the Jews now are under that delusion, for, by and large, you know. I think strong delusion will come upon them. So in other words... Um, well, if you can't believe now, before the rapture happens, it's going to be that much harder. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard now. Yeah. It's going to be next to impossible after the rapture happens. Yes. And I think Absolutely. says, if you hear before and you reject, you won't get another chance. You won't get a chance after, during the tribulation. All the ones saved during that will be ones who have not yet heard. So what is our job right now? I, 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 here's something I find very interesting. He who restrains him will do so until he's taken out of the way. I don't think we realize the restraining power that we have. I mean, collectively, as believers in the world, we shine a brighter light than I think we realize. I mean, I think we are restraining evil. We're restraining evil in our community right here. I mean, I think we are... This community that we live in is not as evil as it could be because we're here. And throughout the world, the world's not as evil because there are believers that are here. So what is our job during this period of time? Restrain evil. Let's, let's hold it back while we're here because we're going to be taken. But while we're here, let's hold it back. How do we hold it back? By sharing the gospel, by leading people to Jesus, 
by sharing our testimony, by preaching the word of truth, by being a light in a dark world. So until we're taken, we're to be the restraining force. We're, we're to be bold. We're to share our faith. We're to be a witness for Christ. That's part of our job. Another part of our job is to be rapture ready. To be ready. You know, I want to be ready. If, if the rapture were to happen, I want to know I'm going. I don't want to be left behind. <laughs> you know, so you want to be saved. You want to be sure you're saved, baptized. Uh, and then we want to help as many other people to be ready as we can because time's running out. You know, th this is a day of urgent evangelism. If you, all are, if you thought one of these days I'm going to witness somebody, buddy, you better get on with it, all right? Because time is running out. We've got, to get, we've got to get real serious about our witness for Jesus Christ. So, two last thoughts. Are you grounded in the Word of God? Are you grounded in the Word of God? Boy, this time period that we're in is going to call for believers to be grounded. So we need to be studying our Bible, reading our Bible, uh, helping our children to be grounded in the Word of God. You know, that's why... All of our Bible studies are important and all of our D groups are important. You know, our D groups are getting people reading the Bible. Our Bible studies are teaching the Bible. And so we've got to ground people in the Word of God. So are you grounded? If not, I'm glad you're here tonight. You know, you're in the right place. Let's keep getting grounded. And then number two, are you committed as a follower of Christ? These days that lie ahead are going to call for a high level of commitment. There's going to be a falling away. The Bible says the falling away is coming. Are you going to be one of the ones that fall away? Are you going to be a part of the falling away? Or are you going to be committed in a time when so many others are falling away? Now, my, I want you guys to be committed. I'm, I want to stay committed. I want my kids to stay committed. Now i got four grandkids. I'm working overtime for them to be committed in a time when everybody else is falling away. So we got our work cut out for us, right? But bottom line is this. What's our main point tonight? The God we serve is in complete control. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Hey, let's pray. Our Father, this chapter, oh my goodness, Lord, it's in the Bible. <laughs> and it is one of the most amazing chapters in the Bible because it everything that's said here happened just as it said. History was told in advance and history happened just as you said it would. God, this chapter shows us that you're in control. And God, we need to hear that in the days that we're living. And just like right now, history is happening in advance, God. We know what's happening. We, when we see all the things taking place, you've told us we can know it, God, and we can be ready. So God, help us to be grounded and help us to be faithful like never before. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.